All right, I am here with Lawrence Krauss. He is a physicist, a cosmologist, a podcast host, and author of a variety of books, including The Physics of Climate Change, soon to be released. How do you do, Lawrence? I'm, uh, I'm doing great. I'm very excited. It's a big day. Joe Biden was just inaugurated as president and feels the air feels better already. Oh, wow. I'm glad that's the case. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're going to get into your thoughts on America post-Trump in a minute. But no. um, I've written out a few questions that I would like to ask. Um, the first one is that, what is the one scientific question that continually puzzles you? Well, I'm puzzled by so many scientific questions. It's hard to just list them at this one. Um, you know, what? one that's near and dear to my heart, I suppose, is, is what's the nature of dark energy? The, ener the, the dominant energy in the universe appears to reside in empty space. And we don't have the slightest idea why it's there uh, and, and what its origin is. And so that's certainly one. Um, another is, is our universe unique? Are, are, there, are, are there many different universes with different laws of physics? Those are, that's a much harder question to answer. The, but the dark energy one is hard too. So, I mean, but there's the great thing about Science is that every day there are new questions, and I'm and, and and I think that's what makes it so exciting is that actually the question searching is probably more interesting than the answers. Yeah, I I think the same thing too. And uh, another question that I wrote down that I really would like to ask you is, uh, what happens to the Invisible Man after he died? <laughs> the Invisible Man after he dies. That's yeah. a good question, but it's a problem of science of science fiction. Uh, um, you know, the Invisible Man is, well, I've written about this in one of my books, actually, but being mm -hmm. invisible is kind of a, a, a problem because you generally, if you're invisible, then you can't see. And it, life isn't as, as, you know, you can't, because if you could interact with photons, then you'd generally be visible, at least. And so uh, if you're transparent, then generally you can't see. And so that sort of defeats the whole purpose of being invisible. But uh, you just asked a, a question a whole different level that I can't answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I it's a it's actually a joke, and the punchline is uh, remains to be seen. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, that was better. Okay, I didn't. I should have known. I was. I should have said I don't know, and then you could give me the punchline. I'm sorry, I ruined your joke. But that's a good one. Remains to be seen. I like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and remember that. Yeah. So uh, you opened with. Uh, the hopeful and optimistic remarks about uh, the new guy that's moving into the White House. And would you like to elaborate on that? Um, no, I mean, I'd rather, I mean, we can talk a little bit, it, it, you know, it's so it's just, it's just great to have a real president, a president who has some idea what's going on in the world, actually is interested in helping others, um, interested in the truth, of course, in some sense, interested in science, but more than that, just a and, you know, someone who is interested in democracy and the normal running of government and knows how to do it and um, actually doesn't invent a world surrounded by themselves, isn't a con artist, a crook, a liar, and a cheat. I mean, it's just, that's all. I mean, independent of your politics, it's great to have someone who isn't willing to send people to, you know, to, to, to perform violence uh, on Congress. I mean, it's, it's a pretty low bar. But I, I'm, I was very pleased. I happened to watch the inauguration. I like to watch, I'm a political junkie and I like to watch inaugurations anyway. And I, and I was very surprised. I was very pleased with Joe Biden's speech. It was very personal and about unity. And, you know, we'll see uh, what happens. He's got a big challenge ahead of him. And, uh, but it just feels like a weight has been lifted off the country. Oh yeah. Um, I think uh, about two or three days ago, I finished your conversation with uh, David Frum, who wrote uh, the two uh, Trump books. And of course, he has obviously more to say about uh, how Trump has uh, become sort of like this uh, arsenic to our political and social and cultural debate, I say. And, and I mean, he was unimaginably bad uh, and it was as bad as many of us thought he'd be and worse. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about it is that we, in principle, don't have to talk about him anymore. We'll see if he can disappear. Uh, I hope he does. But, uh, but the great thing is that the last four years I've had to periodically talk about him, but now we don't have to. So we'd rather talk about Biden. And already he's brought the United States back into the climate 
Paris Climate Accords, his first, his first executive action within a few hours of being president. Now, you know, that's mm -hmm. symbolic, but it's an important bit of symbolism. And since I just wrote a book that's coming out called The Physics of Climate Change in a week or so, that's high on my um, uh, list of interests. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect segue for us to talk about uh, mm -hmm. your, the new book that you authored. Because, yeah, I am quite frustrated by um, yeah, Donald Trump's uh, design to uh, pull out, the, of course, the Paris Climate Accord. And yeah, that's one of the least bad things he did. <laughs> the, list is so, the list is so bad. But, uh, you know, as I say, the worst part is just, is just being a crook and lying to the American public and, and um, not caring about people's well-being. I mean, 400,000 Americans have died. And the last month, all he's cared about is, is, is first lying about the president, you know, being elected and then his image and what he might do. And, and uh, you know, for better or worse, the one thing I hope most people who are, were, would be elected president would do is care something about trying to help. Mm -hmm. And he didn't give a damn about trying to help anyone but himself. Yeah. And of course, I do agree with the fact that, you know, uh, in the post-Trump world, what we need to do sort of like a less and less is to talk about Donald Trump because it it's a I think it's a let's say um a toxic waste of mental energy I I, I remember there's this gag that was uh, said on John Oliver's uh, last week tonight where there's a counter that says day since the last time somebody brought Trump to the dinner table and it always has the number zero on it <laughs> yeah yeah and it will go on for a while and he's not going to try he's obviously not going to try to go gently into the night. I, I'm, I'm expecting we'll have to hear about him. Oh, there's going to be a trial, I assume, in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that there will be lots of legal proceedings. And, um, and, and, and so we'll have to hear about those. But it won't be a regular figure. And we mm -hmm. can hear about dealing with the real problems that we need to deal with, which have been so distracted. That's the other thing that's so problematic. There are real problems that this country and the world has to deal with. And the distractions of his nonsense just get in the way. I mean, but it's unfortunately the case with a lot of politics and journalists. They cover the distractions and not the substance. Yeah, and uh, well, one of the obviously important problems that got lost in the wayside is climate change. And yeah, and so uh, how would you summarize or how would you introduce your the new book that is coming out since? Uh, it's, well, as of today, it's not been there. It's not there yet. Yeah. No, no, it's coming out in e in audiobook and ebook on January 26th, and then the hardcover because of the pandemic and others was delayed. It was supposed to come out the same day, but it's coming out February 9th. And uh, so, um, but you can pre-order them all already, and I hope people will. But um, I, I think the point is that it's a book about the science, the physics of climate change is aptly named. It's this. There's these many illusions about. So I just produced a. Uh, an episode from my podcast uh, called Science Matters Today that came out a few minutes ago uh, with five big misconceptions about science change that people can watch. Um, but I, there are many misconceptions. And one is that, that, that somehow the science is, is, involves detailed, complex models that are uncertain and, and, you, and no one can really understand it. And, and it involves predictions about the future that are uncertain. And the point is, climate, as I try and show, the physical climate change is actually based on well-established science and it's kind of fun to learn it. And, and it's meant for, to show that anyone can kind of understand the basic science behind climate change, which I think is a first step. There's, I don't discuss policy in the book because I think one policy depends upon a, a sound science. And it's the first step in forming policy with empirical evidence and, 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 and the scientific knowledge that we have. And so what I wanted to do was write a book that be independent of what side of the political fence you're on, um, which just gives a scientific basis of what's, 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 what the predictions are, what the science is, what the, set, what the firm predictions are, what's inevitable, what's happening today, what's more uncertain. So people can get a perspective and then they can use that proper perspective to, to, to talk about policy. So it's a book, um, it's a book for everyone to really get, get to ground zero on it. And one of the reasons, one of the, I'm quite excited the foundation I run is gonna be sending a copy of it to every member of the new Congress to oh, hopefully help, help uh, educate them <laughs> or at least their staff members. And mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and I think if, if, you, if you can't, as I kind of said in, in, um, 
in 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 the book actually if it isn't possible to explain the scientific principles and predictions associated with climate change in a straightforward and, and accessible fashion then what hope is there for any rational public discourse and decision making on the subject so the first step is what i try to do and it's fun also i try and talk about the as i say the history and some of the things that you may not know about it and some of the sort of misconceptions you might have about climate change it was fun for me to learn about it mm -hmm. uh, and 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 to realize that it's not only happening now but there's some things that are you know, sea level rise is not happening now, not just because of melting of glaciers and things that may be more uncertain, but we've dumped all this heat in the ocean that's that's there. The ocean takes a long time to thermalize it. And at least 50% of the ocean rise is happening now just because the heat we've already dumped in, because you heat water up, it expands. There's nothing fancy about it. It's basic physics and there's nothing uncertain about it. And, and over the next century, the, at, at a minimum, we're gonna have about a third of a meter to maybe a half a meter of sea level rise just due to thermal expansion of the ocean, which may not sound like a lot, but a half a meter is significant since about 100, so well, since about 600 million people around the world live within a meter of sea level, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, above sea level. And at high tide, you're gonna, so these are issues that need to be dealt with. But in any case, the book is meant for anyone and, and it also provides a lot of data and people and act and references that people would look up online uh, so it's not a textbook and um it began actually it begins and ends with the mekong delta where i i i led a group uh a year ago uh, a year ago yesterday i returned from there uh which is kind of like the perfect storm because most of south vietnam will actually be within underwater and in, in by 2100 um, unless we do something uh and and the Mekong River, it has more freshwater fish than any other river in the world and feeds, you know, between 15 and 50 million people. And, and, um, and that's, that's an area sort of, like I say, it's a perfect storm. It's a low, it, it, it's, it's, it's low level. It's just almost at sea level, the, the Mekong Delta builds up and there's a high tide that right now the Mekong River can defeat. But the rice, which is grown there, depends upon that tide not encroaching in the land. And, Anyway, it became very personal for me, so I began and ended the book on, on uh, there. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the the Mekong de Delta because uh, I I grew up in Hanoi, Vietnam. I was born yeah. and raised there, and I think um I think the one of the uh, I think uh, according to uh, international data, I think the IPCC may have uh, may have published this, but uh, I think one of the places that are being harmed the most by climate change is actually my country, Vietnam. And well, it will. It's, it's amazing. And, and there's new data that makes it even worse because you've got this, you've got the Delta fighting the sea and the Delta feeds, produces one of the, it is the richest, most intense rice growing area in the world. And there are several factors. One is it turned out, we now understand that actually the elevation of much of South Vietnam is actually lower than it was previously thought. It was previously thought between one and two meters. Now it's most of that South Vietnam, at least, is below one meter above sea level. Mm -hmm. But also because of lots of efforts on the, uh, there's subsiding of the land because of use of the water. And also the, the, the Mekong River itself is, is, the elevation of Mekong River has gone down by, by uh, a significant amount. Uh, in the last 20 years because of, of dredging and using that the sand for concrete. So it's a combination of many things and it is going to, it's going it, to, it's a place where, where, you know, the future with long-term future stuff is one thing, but in the next 30 years, it's going to be affected and impacted directly uh, by climate change. And it's, a, it's, a, it's unfortunate and, and we need to do something about it, I hope, mm -hmm. but it's unfortunate because, you know, I think of that area of South Vietnam and Vietnam and Cambodia, which have suffered in so many ways because of human activity in the last century. And it's come out of it beautifully. That's, you know, I happen to love the, the people of Cambodia and Vietnam are just wonderful. And so in spite of all the troubles are, are so ebullient and, 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 and friendly. And, 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 it, and it, it's kind of amazing that they've come out of this human, these human tragedies and now largely due to circumstances beyond their control, they're gonna to have to suffer uh, yet another assault. It's, it's, it's sad. Oh yeah, and what I find, uh, what I find was it frustrating is that 
um, a, a lot of talks about uh, the, the subject of climate change, at least uh, in North America and in Canada where I live. And um, is that if the, it's so marked by political ideology, I say. And, well, and, and that's important for it shouldn't be. It should, yeah. you know, because science is not conservative or liberal or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever you want to, whatever terms you want to call it. Um, uh, left wing or right wing, the science is is is, you know, as 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 I used to say about the Big Bang, the Big Bang happened whether you like it or not. The universe doesn't care whether you like it or whether you agree, and the Earth doesn't. And it's not gloom and doom. The point is that we can't deal with. It's not as if it's so tragic that the world is ending, as some people suggest, which I think is equally bad. Um, and some of the, some of my you know people, li Democrats and liberals. You know, just spout this nonsense about how in 12 years the world will be over, and that's just nonsense. I mean, not due to climate change, it won't be anyway. Um, but there are severe challenges, and we need to understand them if we're going to address them. And we need to understand how to put off some of the other inevitable consequences of climate change. It's mm -hmm. sad that it's become so political, and that's precisely why I decided in my book to not talk about policy, because immediately that would turn off a large fraction of the population. If I just restrict myself to the science and what we know, then I'm hoping that people of all political strikes can find the book useful. And part of the, you know, part of my test crew audience there was my friend Penn Gillette, who's a magician. Yes, Penn and Tell. Who writes, wrote a blurb on the back of my book. And, all right. And, and his re response was, ex was exactly what I hoped. Is he's basically saying, I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be, you know, spoon fed by politicians about things they don't know about i want to i just want to know what the issues are so i can make up my own mind and uh, and he was very happy he said this is the book i've been waiting for so i was very pleased when when that was his response yeah which uh, i think makes me even more excited about the book's release and i think uh, one of the well many things that um that i'm a fan of uh, your work that makes me an admirer of yours is that you uh, you you always take a stance, uh, well, for the uh, ed public education and how to make a more informed democratic populace, and as well as your stance against uh, dogmatism, uh, which is most notably displayed in the film you made with uh, Richard Dawkins, The Unbelievers, and the uh, Wall Street Journal piece that came out uh, last year where you defended, you know, scientific research against um, well, this uh, new uh, this new uh, sort of quasi religion of uh, yeah. anti racism, yeah. Which uh, of course uh, it is something that disturbs me as well. And um, so I guess my my question is how how can you know say the the average Joe, the normal citizen, the would be reader of uh, scientific books, um, how can he um, how can he I guess uh, freeze himself or herself. Uh, from, from political dogma, and well, that's the... what's great about science. I mean, yeah. so, so, you know, science is great because it it, it understands that we all, it, it's just it's built to counter the tendencies that all of us have. To all of us want to believe what we want to believe, and you know, Fox Melder was in the X Files was right in saying you know mm -hmm. we want to believe, but. Uh, it's true, and science is designed to realize that the easiest person to fool is yourself. And so there, here are the techniques by which you can avoid fooling yourself. Check the evidence. If you come up with an idea, check to see if it agrees with the evidence. And that means not searching just, you know, that means continually, as Richard Feynman used to say, work just as hard to disprove a theory as prove it. Even if you love it, you should be trying to disprove it to see if it's wrong. And then keep checking. Check sources widely, just don't use just one source, but look at other things that may. So it, it's true when you're looking at evidence, just don't, don't, don't look online in an echo chamber of just the sources that you agree with, um, but try and see more broadly if, if things are, are, make sense. Uh, and so I think the way that we can all, that's why I think science, that's why I spend a lot of my time talking about science for the public, not just because it's fascinating and it, I think it is, but because the tools of science are essential for all of us if we want to avoid um, being misled and 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 the, and by by other people or or by ourselves, and so 
That's why science is worth spreading more broadly. It's not that it's some, you know, that I think it's more important culturally than English literature, but it's a tool that can allow us to, 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 to avoid those traps of self-delusion that we all naturally suffer under. It's, it's true for all of us. And, um, and then we can all become evangelists for science. Forget being evangelists for, for religion, <laughs> be evangelists for science. I thought you were going to ask, and I'll answer it, even though you didn't ask it. How can what can we do about these problems? And and you know we feel so small when it comes to climate change or some other issue. The answer is that we all have soapboxes. Some of us have bigger soapboxes than others, but but we all affect others, either our children or or their kids in school, or if you go to church, the church. And so by educating yourself about, and that's why I try and provide these tools. That's the other thing I hope the physics stuff of climate change can do is provide people arguments that they can use in their discussions with others. So they have some, they have some backup and, and, they, and, and credibility. And, and I, so I think we can all reach out to others and ultimately governments don't lead, they follow. And if we want to have real action, ultimately the governments, whether they're democratic or not, mm -hmm. if, they, if, they don't, if they feel the public doesn't care, they're not gonna do anything. And when they feel the public does care, even if they're not a democracy, in order to maintain power, they're going to act. Of course, yeah. And I think uh, I, I, I would like to put a pin on that quotation of yours. Governments don't lead, they follow. And I think that's a very powerful statement because uh, <clears throat> um, for me, uh, I, I don't think I'm, I'm one of those person that, um, I want to say, believe in the government. I'm actually very skeptical of it um, because, well, I, I grew up under uh, the Vietnamese Communist Party where there are human rights crimes. And, yes. uh, and of course, in America, we have people who have, uh, very, who have failed, uh, you know, who have failed our expectations, or at least um, are, who have failed to account for themselves. Uh, of course, the recently departed uh, former president. And I think my favorite example would be uh, Richard Nixon. Um, so I'm, it was present before you were born, I'm sure, but I remember it. I just tweeted today that I remember mm -hmm. I moved to the United States right after I watched Jimmy Carter walking down Pennsylvania Avenue 44 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was coming to the United States and thinking, wow, uh, you know, it's a new time for healing and rebirth after Nixon. Um, and, and I feel, I, in a sense, I feel, I felt very similar with, with, with Joe Biden, the, you know, countering a, a, a crooked president. In the case of Nixon, it was very different. Nixon was actually a competent man, an intelligent man, none of which I think uh, the ex-president we just missed uh, mm -hmm. uh, was. But, but it was still a big problem in the country. And I kind of feel the same kind of momentary sense of hope uh, mixed with skepticism, of course, because politicians are po politicians. And, and also, it's for me, it's poetic because I moved to the United States right after Amy Carter, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm moving back to Canada later this year. And, and so uh, sort of, I sort of feel that same kind of wistfulness. But, but you know, where I really, where, what really convinced me that, that governments follow, they don't lead, was really years ago when I was a graduate student, just after moving to the United States, when I was doing my PhD at MIT, I was fortunate enough to attend a, a few classes of someone who then became a friend of mine, Noam Chomsky. Um, uh, and, and it really seeing, and it was Vietnam. It was seeing how the last people to so ultimately realize that the Vietnam War was, it was, was a huge, not just not only a mistake, but was, was fundamentally wrong, yeah. was the government in some ways. And academics were right back there. The, it was the young people, it was the, it was the public that ultimately forced government to act in that case. And it's a great example of how, of how that can become. I will also say, I can't help but say when I was in Vietnam, I, I was in Vietnam in 1997, which maybe have been before you were born too. I don't know how old yeah. you are. Yeah, I was last there then, right when it was coming out of, uh, of extreme isolation and, and there was a conference designed to bring Vietnam back into the world. There was also a total eclipse of the sun. And it was exciting for me to see that there was such a, at that time, relatively back, backward in terms of, you know, it, it had just suffered under war. And, but now it was, I was very surprised to see how technologically sophisticated and also how happy and, and, and free the people seem to be even under 
what is a communist regime in, in, when I was at least in, in, in Saigon. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, it, was, it was a real pleasure for me to see, but also sad to think how many people had died for nothing, in a sense that died to protect the people of South Vietnam from something which right now, if you look at, they're, they're thriving. And, 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 uh, and it was just all those lives on both sides wasted. Anyway. It's, um, it's quite tragic. And I think my dad, uh, who's now living in Hanoi, he, he has uh, made plans or he has talked about plans to uh, move to Ho Chi Minh City. That's the now that's the now name of Saigon. Um, it's, although, I, it's, although in Ho Chi Minh City, all the people still call it Saigon. So there you go. Oh, was, of course. Yeah. Um, 1997 was rigid. It was Ho Chi Minh City. And I was really mm -hmm. see that now, you know, some uh, 20 some odd years later, it's uh, 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 it, 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 things have relaxed in that way as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what I what I really admire about Chomsky, uh, even though of course, I, I would like to engage with uh, his ideas, you know, critically and all that. Is that he? I think uh, he he could have been like a, he could have spent much of his life like focusing on linguistic, and he was clearly a master at that. But uh, the events uh, unfolding in Vietnam forces him to take a stance. And uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, look, he was a role model for me. I mean, when I was a student, I went to talks by Chomsky and other people. And scientists who were committed to trying to talk about national defense issues, nuclear weapons. And that had a profound effect on me. I, I told myself if I was ever in that position to be able to be successful enough to, to, to be able to you know, reach out, I would do that. So it, certainly Chomsky was a, was a huge role model for me and still is. In particular, what I really enjoyed about, what I really impressed me about Noam Chomsky the first time I saw him in, Cambridge, even before I really got to know him. I remember he gave a talk, and after the talk, he stayed for two or three hours afterwards just to answer every single question. And I think that's really important because people's questions are more important than the talks. And, and I, I know in my when I try and give talks, I, I, I like to try and do just that, is to, is, to, is to be able to reach out and answer people's questions um, and treat them with respect. And, and, you know, people are afraid when they come up they were, you know, afraid when they came up to Chomsky, afraid to when they come to me, and it's it's important to try and make them realize that their questions are important and relevant, and uh, and I like to do that. I think that every teacher should do that. Questions are are really important, and encouraging students and the public to question is one of the most important things any of us can do. Of course, yeah, and uh, okay. So, which brings me to. Uh, the music part of uh, our chat, our conversation. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I would like to start with is that um, the, um, the at the beginning of the year, uh, you released a, a podcast interview with Woody Allen, who I think is my favorite writer and filmmaker. And I guess my question to you is that, what is your favorite Woody Allen film? Oh gosh, people, you know, you may know this, but people always ask me, what is my favorite anything? And my answer is always, <laughs> I don't tend to think in terms of favorites. I don't tend to think hierarchically. I tend to think of all things I like, but you know, the, well, lots of his movies have affected me differently, but Annie Hall mm -hmm. came out at a, maybe a key time for me and profoundly, um, it was a profoundly important movie, I thought in general. And it, I happened to relate to well, many things that happened in the movie. I, I didn't enjoy his earlier movies. Um, and of course, now that now I've come to know many of the later movies, but for me, Annie Hall was a, was a pivotal movie. It was, and it, you know, won the best film or best director at it, for a reason. It was as, as a bit of movie making, it was, it was groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've, I've enjoyed, and of course, when I, when I knew I was going to, well, Woody has become a, a friend, which is so weird for me to say, but um, over the years, but um, when I work hard to prepare for my podcast discussions, and I think of them more as discussions and interviews. And so I watched many of his movies again, and, and when he and some that I hadn't seen before, but I, I have to say there's some really interesting, you know, the, among the more recent movies, uh, I think Zelig and Stardust Memories are two mm -hmm. great ones. I know I know he likes both of them, and uh, and maybe that affects me as well. Um, but I think he is a, 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 an incredibly important filmmaker, humorist, writer, and I was happy to be able to give him provide an additional platform. 
and he doesn't and also i was honored i you know i i don't think he that he trusted me if he hasn't done an interview like that of that length or depth in in years and years and so i thought it'd be a good chance for people and what however popular it is now but over time for people to have a record of of Woody, of, of Woody Allen, the man and his thinking. So I was very honored and pleased to be able to do it. And I'm happy with how it came out, except for the fact that he won't cast me in one of his movies, other than that. <laughs> oh, no. oh. And he, and you know, what we didn't talk about, speaking of music, mm -hmm. we did talk about it in the podcast, but it was, a, you know, we always edit it down to make mm -hmm. it a little more accessible for people. Was, you know, he loves to use old jazz in his, in, 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 mm -hmm. he, he, what was the pop music when he was growing up mm -hmm. in his films? Yes. And I, and I, and I, and I, and he, he's just, and I tried to indicate to him that the, that the rock and roll, which was the pop music when I grew up is, is, is equally good, but he's <laughs> tied to that. He's tied to that notion of that music of his era being, I think we're all that way in some ways. We, it, we, because it's so important to us growing up, the music of our youth always has a, spe a special place for us. And it certainly did for him. Mm -hmm. So I, that gives you a segue to music if you want. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I appreciate um, I appreciate Woody's music choices in in a variety of his films, and one of the examples that bring that I spring to mind is the opening scene of Manhattan, where he uses uh, Gershwin's uh, Rhapsody in Blue. Um, but what I what I well, um, I'm not sure if. Uh, I'm not sure if this works as a metaphor, but um, I think um, watching Woody Allen's movie is, is the first time that I I, I detected uh, a hint of musicality in in like in speech in dialogue, right. and I'm I feel like the the dialogue that that was written and performed by Woody Allen and his actors in his movies had this. Melody, melody, and rhythm to it. I, would, I should. I, I don't think I've ever talked to Woody about that, but it is interesting. I, he is certainly very musical, and he and you know very musical, and music is a big part of life. He plays music, as you know, and and mm -hmm. um, and, and so it, whether he's thinking musically when he's writing with by hand on pieces of paper is an interesting question, and I'll have to ask him that next time I mm -hmm. I talk to him. It, it's interesting. Uh, I'll have to think about that. I haven't. I hadn't thought about that myself when I thought about his movies. There are some movies where musicality or is is obvious. Well, I, even then, I sometimes have to be reminded of it because I love music, but I have very unlike my daughter, who's very who played the violin and is very musical, mm -hmm. um, and had first perfect pitch and all the rest. I I love music, but I have not musically talented, and um, you know, I, it wasn't even. The movie Baby Driver, which you may have seen, it, it would took a, one of my cinematographers who works with me to make me realize that eight, basically every every law, you know, everything is timed to to, to oh. it, yeah, you've got to watch it. it. Every every cut and every frame is is tied to the sound. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of amazing. I had it's it, I watched that movie in a whole different way. So for whatever, that's not a Woody Allen movie, but it but nevertheless it is. So but but uh, yeah, so. Uh, I, as I say, I, I like music of all sorts, uh, although I I, uh, I love the music of my youth, but I, I've tried to, well, when my daughter became, and she started the violin when she was a little two and a half or something, because she, of her own volition, which was even weirder, mm -hmm. um, I became more, much more a part of the classical musical community than I had before, and I now have many connections that I didn't have before, and I'm, I'm pleased to say and i didn't used to put it on my cv but that i that i've been nominated for a grammy and and i've been <laughs> and and i, I soloed with the cleveland orchestra which is mm -hmm. a, both of which are great but profoundly neat although i have as i say it, it sounds better than it is my my <laughs> nomination for a grammy was for the liner notes for the music from star trek and uh and performing at the cleveland orchestra was just simply i wrote a, a narration for holst the planets which is uh, oh. which i performed with them and it was their most popular event but it was an honor to be with the Cleveland Orchestra so it's you know it's but my daughter was so worried when I when I started to do that because she's actually had sung with the Cleveland Orchestra as well and she was worried I'd screwed up and I was happy my my narration was between the movements so I didn't have to keep time <laughs> or anything like that uh, I'm glad you mentioned Baby Driver uh, it's 
I, I haven't actually seen it, but uh, I've seen uh, Edgar Rice's previous films and yeah. they all have this, um, he, he is so masterful at like, um, you know, um, connecting or constructing the scene so that it fits with uh, certain musical patterns. And this was uh, every scene. I mean, I think there's not one in the whole movie. I have to watch it for that reason. It's, it blew me away when I, when I, and I'm not sure I would have realized it on my own if, if it hadn't been told about it. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the funniest scene, uh, I saw Shaun of the Dead, and I think the most memorable scene in that film is when uh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost discovered that the, the zombies are in the backyard, and <laughs> and they try to tort, tort the zombies by bringing out their record collection, and, <laughs> and they were sifting through, um, was it Prince's Purple Rain is not, uh, is not expandable, but the Batman soundtrack is? <laughs> Yeah, um, which uh, of course brings me to the Prince question. Um, so, um, how how does Prince resonate with you? What are your thoughts on Prince? Oh, he's a, he's a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I I actually ran into him once, um, but that's yeah. a different story. It, and that was just an accident. It, it turns out in the airport in Min, in Minneapolis, where, where I guess he lived, I was landing about midnight, mm -hmm. and um, and in this cart next to me, <laughs> without his shirt on. You know, there was Prince, and I remember a young teeny bopper came walking by, and and <laughs> well after he passed, realized who he was and started chasing it. But but yeah, he I mean he he's incredibly influential, incredibly talented. Uh, he was an incredibly talented musician. So I'm not sure, I, like many things, because I'm slow in these regards, I'm not sure I appreciated him sufficiently at the time. Uh, um, it was only later, you know, because uh, because I'm not that musically astute. Uh, I think I, I have to, it takes me time to realize things or, or, or to have people who are more musically talented than I am um, uh, uh, point out certain things. So so I appreciate it more because of my musical friends. I'm just going to pick up my dog who's bothering me. Right now. He's scratching on me because he wants his food. But anyway. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Oh, uh, what's his name, by the way? Levi. Levi, like Strauss. Like Levi's, yeah. I think that's the reason he, uh, my my stepdaughter named him, and I think she, he was named after the genes more than as a uh. lost prophet of Israel. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, I think uh, you should really pick up uh, his uh, memoir. His uh, it's called "The Beautiful Ones," named after oh. the oh. song. Oh, okay. Yeah, now that might be nice. I, that that would be a that would be a, a, a nice thing to do. Um, and so, uh, um, and yeah, and to uh, return, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, um, to return to Woody Allen, um, he he made a film in 1996 called uh, "Everyone Says I Love You," which is yeah. uh, a musical. And and uh, um, what I find interesting about that musical is that it's a musical for people who, even though they are not proficient in music, they like to sing. Yeah, yeah. And, no, it's, it's, it's they all these people sing who aren't who aren't singers. And I think that's <laughs> Probably one of the reasons I actually enjoyed the movie Mamma Mia too, for that reason. Yeah. Because it was clear they were just having a good time. And I mean, mm -hmm. some of them are very good singers and others aren't. And and they had the guts to do that. I would never sing in public. I'm telling you that now. I would never, I wouldn't subject anyone to that. <laughs> but it's great to see people who have the guts to do it. Uh, my, my parents are really big ABBA fans. And uh, it's a staple for our new year, um, the, the Lunar New Year or Tet as the Vietnamese call it, to play ABBA's Happy New Year, like at every house right. all over and over oh, again. That's great. Well, I, I'm, I, I like ABBA and I was I was privileged to speak and to be in Sweden several times. Mm -hmm. and, and again, to meet one of the members of ABBA who runs, owns a theater that I actually spoke in uh, about religion of all things mm -hmm. in, in Stockholm. And uh, they, they were, ABBA was incredibly important. They were the major export of Sweden for a few years, mm -hmm. literally, anyway. Well. <laughs> and they were my uncle, my late uncle's favorite, favorite uh, mm -hmm. group. He used to listen to them all the time. Um, yeah, the songs are catchy. They're great. I have no problem with them. And uh, so I think uh, we, I've started our email chat mentioning um, the name James Horner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder uh, if you'd like to compare the merits of uh, James and John Williams, which you're, you're welcome to do, obviously. But uh, uh, what I am curious about is that uh, do you listen to music, um, like film soundtracks, but independent from the film? 
sometimes it did, I mean, not, not a lot, I must admit sometimes. And, and of course I had to listen to a lot of James Horner when I was writing the, the, the liner notes for the music for Star Trek. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's some music that is, that is memorable. And then sometimes what I, what happens to me, uh, I probably, cause I'm not primarily musical is I'll watch a music movie and I won't appreciate all the music that's in it. I love to watch the credit. I won't leave a movie till I've seen the credits because I think it's important. And I'll see all of this music that was in the movie. And I'll say, I, I just, you know, I was so, so engrossed in the action or the plot or whatever that I, I you know, I wasn't appreciating the, and, and then I'll want to listen to the soundtrack afterwards because the movies, you know, great. and then there's some movies whose soundtrack, I mean, the, the, for me, the movie, The Big Chill, I mean, I mean, we bought their soundtrack, for example, and, and um, because it was the music that I grew up with and I, I, I liked it. But, but I generally, there have been only a few times where I bought um, uh, music soundtracks. One, one was the, the soundtrack from uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I'd ever heard Aljo Spach's Zarathustra, which is, the, you know, this famous music for the, yeah. the, the, the and, and uh, an, an impact on me. And of course, I should, I, I should say my mother, I, I was brought up on musicals when I was a kid, I'll the standard music. So I, I used to listen to the music, mu you know, soundtracks from musicals all the time, The King and I and, and, you know, Oklahoma and My Fair Lady and all that. I used to, I was brought up with that, so. I, yeah, I, I recently turned. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Anyway, sorry, Fiddler on the Roof is another important one. Go on. Oh yes, yes. Um, uh, my my dad recently saw Doctor Zhivago the first time. Oh. I actually told him about it, and um, he 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 did not know that the the famous composition was part of Doctor Zhivago. He remember he remember hearing that piece of music all the time back in his college years. Sure. It's a big ubiquitous. Oh, interesting. He heard it. He went to college in Vietnam. Oh, um, the Philippines. In the Philippines. Okay, but uh, but yeah, no. Lara's theme is ubiquitous. Absolutely, yeah. So it was the, from from Doctor Zhivago. Mm -hmm. I remember when I I played the I played a lot of instruments badly, mm -hmm. but when I remember when I was learning the piano, I learned Lara's theme. It was one of the things. I, it's pretty simple. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so I think uh. So you're a big fan of Star Trek, and uh, I wonder if has anyone ever asked you which Star Trek character do you think would be the most musically adept? And if every one of them started a band, uh, who do you think would play what instrument? Wow, interesting. Um, interesting. Well, of, of course, Data would be incredibly musically adept because mm -hmm. he would be able to. I don't know if be able to play with emotion though. That's the difference. Be able to, you know technically mm. play better than anyone else. Um, but I think, uh, I think Jean-Luc Picard would be into jazz. Oh, yes. And, although he plays classical music, I know, in his, in his cabin. Um, it would be interesting to see. And of course, um, um, uh, I don't think of, I don't think of, maybe because I know Bill Shatner as well. <laughs> I, 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 uh, but his character, I don't think is, uh, would be very musical. Although, you know, if in the new in the remake of Star Trek in the new movies, I think the person who plays uh, um, uh, Kirk, yeah, Chris Pine, yeah, 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 exactly, Chris Pine who plays Kirk. Um, I think of him as more of a rocker. Yeah, I think he'd be a, he'd, he'd be fine in a rock and roll band. Yeah, I think uh, William Shatner is a pretty musical person as well. He is. Yeah, well, he's <laughs> sung, and I know he has. I know he's done these things. I guess I shouldn't say that, and I hope he doesn't listen to this. But uh, yeah, he's done a lot of, he, I know he's made albums and things, but the character is what I was thinking more than Bill. Um, I mean, his version of, of, of Kirk is not, uh, may, maybe, may, maybe it's something, you know, I, I guess I, ju I just don't think of it as, as uh, while he's emotional, um, I, I, for some reason, I guess I, I think of John Luke Picard as being more, uh, think more musical. I don't know why, it's here's the question. I think I think it would be an incredible feat if uh, William Shatner actually found this uh, audio conversation of ours <laughs> or the video, and I think uh, that that is I think a sign of uh, my personal success and you know a personal <laughs> triumph for myself. Well, but, uh, uh, so uh, we yeah. are almost out of time. As my therapist, who charges me two hundred a session, 
says. Um, You're so uh, well adjusted. You, I can tell you right now, you don't need a therapist. You seem very well adjusted to me, very, very well adjusted and literate. Oh, and thank you very much. It is be, I shouldn't I say that, anyway. I mean, it is because of my years of seeing a therapist, obviously. Uh -huh. But um, so uh -huh. we, we are running out of time, of course, as my therapist says. So Lawrence Krauss, uh, physicist and author and podcaster, what would you like to say to the, the listener to uh, conclude the, the conversation? Well, wow, geez, I, I, you know, we've covered so many different things, but it, I, first of all, I just like to say it's been a pleasure talking to you. Oh, thank you. And, um, and um, you know, um, I, you know I, I can't, I guess I'm supposed to plug things. I, I, I hope people, you know, I know about podcasts, you do, but I really have enjoyed doing the podcasts I've done. And, and, and I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of interesting guests and some uh, many uh, uh, who are on, uh, slated to appear. So I hope people enjoy that, but I just hope people will just continue to ask themselves questions, continue to question themselves and to enjoy the universe without all the nonsense. Enjoy the real universe. Enjoy the, the, the magnificence of the cosmos and, and, and our amazing ability to comprehend it and the fact that we can appreciate it through voice and music is to me something that makes life worth living. I guess that's all I'd say. Well, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence Krauss, thank you very much. It's been an honor. It's been an honor. Oh, thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. You, you take care. Thank you. You too.